A federal high court sitting in Oka, the Anambra state capital, has affirmed Chukuma Saludu, former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, as the candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, APGA, ahead of the governorship election in the state. Saludu, who belongs to the Victoria-led faction of APGA, had secured 740 votes to defeat Ezinwankwo uh, Christopher, who polled 41 votes, while Thank God Ibi had four votes, and Okolo Chibuzo got seven votes. But in the list published on July 16, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, picked Michael Moji over Saludo as the standard bearer for APGA. INEC said it based its decisions on a court order. First, Sukoye, INEC Commissioner for Information and Voter Education, also told the cable that Musa Ubale, judge of a high court in Jigawa State, had passed judgment in a suit upholding the suspension of Victor Oye and affirming Jude Okeke as the party's national chairman on June 30, 2021. Okoye also cited another court order in which Bello Kau, a judge at the Federal Cap um, Capital Territory um, FCT High Court in Kuba, on June 28th, ordered INEC to monitor the primary election of the Jude Okeke faction and comply with the results. Moji won the primaries in Okeke's faction. But delivering judgment on Monday, Chukwu Dioka, presiding judge, said the other parties in the suit comprising Jude Okeke, Edozi Unjoku and Chukuma Umoji were meddlesome interlopers. The judge therefore affirmed Oye as the national chairman of the party and other INEC to recognize Saludo as the APGA governorship candidate for Anambra. Now, joining us this morning to talk about all this is the um, former CBN governor and now APGA candidate, Mr. Chukuma Saludo. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning and thank you, Adam. Um, it's really a great pleasure. Okay. Let me say the Salah to all our uh, Muslim friends and uh, happy holidays to our Nigerians. Okay, so how do you feel about this court judgment that has now ruled that you are the authentic Abga candidates for the elections come November? Well, I will always say that the judiciary will always come through uh, in the end. Uh, this is our number, this is the season of all kinds of uh, court orders and court judgment flying from all over the 36 states of Nigeria. That's part of our judicial system. Uh, I don't understand it. Why, why um, an election in Anambra should have um, uh, court orders and judgments coming from Benin Kudu, which is about a thousand kilometers uh, from Oka, <laughs> where the action is. But that is the season. And so, um, Finally, I believe what happened yesterday at Oka is part of the very first, I mean, part of the very important steps in the resolution of uh, this, um, uh, what I might call uh, confusion that was deliberately created, let me put it that way, deliberately created over the past few weeks, uh, so to speak. Uh, it is a creation of the courts. There was no crisis in Africa. INEC, as you quoted uh, Festus Okoye, was on television just about two weeks or thereabout ago and stated emphatically that there was no crisis in Africa. There was no dispute about the leadership of Africa. There was nothing. Africa was one united family under Victor Ye as the national chairman, and which was also in the INEC um, uh, website uh, and so on. Because Okoye, emerged through a national convention monitored and certified by INEC. The, uh, a court judgment at Orca on 19th of October last year affirmed that convention and affirmed OIE as the national chairman. And up until now, there has been no national convention that to obtain it. And a federal high, I mean, an appeal court had stated that only a national convention of a party can remove the chairman of the party. No such thing has happened. There is no court that has removed him. But then all of a sudden, how did this all emerge? So you woke up one day and people, we all applied to, um, to the same OIE national chairman, the only national chairman, the only national executive, 
Nine of us went to the Africa Secretariat, bought our forms for nomination and expression of interest. Nine of us went for um, uh, the uh, screening. And at the end, they screened out and found four of us worthy to proceed to the next stage of primaries and disqualified five. Now, the other five, one of them and the committee said was unfit to <laughs> run for primaries, let alone being governor. Then created his own chairman. Uh, you know, he got out of the place and decided to nominate somebody as his own chairman. And then you travel out the way a thousand kilometers away to now go and get a court judgment affirming your own chairman and then get there an order ordering the um, INEC to accept nomination done by this same person. I mean, that's the 11th wonder of the world, as it were. And so for me, therefore, in the context of all, um, when it came, I was a bit surprised at the way that, that, that I neck could actually yield to this because there were also other subsisting courts, three court, one court final judgment, uh, but oh yes, chairman. There were two court orders, federal high court order and state high court, ordering INEC to maintain my nomination, which it had actually received on the 2nd of July. And that INEC ignored those three, and then ignored the Electoral Act, which Section 31, Subsection 3, mandated, mandates INEC to publish my name within seven days of receipt of the nomination. He received and acknowledged my nomination on the 2nd, and it was supposed to have published my name and the particulars on or before the 9th, if my calculation is right, from 2nd to 9th. It was by electoral act mandated that the commission shall, within seven days, publish these particulars and so on. It fell. So I was a little bit surprised that INEC could go that far, uh, could go this way. Uh, and then rather than decided to obey the one, the courts in uh, Benin Kudu or whatever, that woke up one morning and created um, this chairman. And I'm just wondering if in a country today, we wake up one morning and we we'll get a court order uh, from somewhere and, and saying that the one um, Giancolo uh, uh, Nicholas is now the um, president of Nigeria. M Mr. Sududo, um, really, that, that really is the crux of where I was heading regarding this whole you know, situation in Anambra State. So you mentioned that there were INEC reps you know, at that you know, um, screening and the primaries where you were confirmed winner. But then how do you then take it that INEC went ahead to ignore that, to you know, obey a court order from out of Anambra State? Well, I think only INEC can uh, explain that. In fact, that's the point I was just making. Uh, we're saying that in this country, we know how a president is elected. We know how he's sworn in. We know how he is removed validly. And then, so if someday somebody wakes up in uh, either Ekiti or in Anambra or whatever, a high court says one uh, Giancolo, Michael, or what Nicholas or whoever, is now president, is acting president of Nigeria because uh, that he claims to have a former vice president. We knew we know who the vice president is. Uh, that he, he claims to have a former vice president and he has sacked the president and has taken over. We start regarding the person as um, president of Nigeria and we say we are obeying the court destiny. Now that's part of the puzzle which I think the courts and I want to believe that ultimately INEC will come. Um, uh, through on this, because for INEC, they monitored the convention that produced a year. INEC has not monitored any other convention to produce any other candidate. The Electoral Act requires it to do so. There is no meeting of party to elect a party candidate, party officer that INEC will not monitor according to the Electoral Act. It hasn't done that. They monitored the convention that produced a year, certified it, has been dealing with him and it's been on the website. All the officers of the party have been on the website of the party up until, uh, of INEC up until last Friday. Now, so, and then you receive my nomination on the 2nd. 
The seven national chairman whom you recognize, you know that the law recognizes. You gave him the code to upload the nomination on the second. So on the on, on the on the thirtieth, as national chairman of Africa, on the second he uploads my name, get the acknowledgement. The electoral act requires you mandatorily to publish my name within seven days. You fail to do so. Now on the fifteenth of the month. The commission now met to say, ah, there's a cut or die, cut uh, whatever, from Benin Kudu. We have to obey this well. Why disregarding the court judgment earlier that meant, oh, yeah, the chairman and that farm that, and it hasn't. By the way, the uh, Jigawa or the Benin Kudu uh, judgment in Jigawa never said, I mean, clearly spelled out that Judo Keke claimed that he was deputy to one Edozian Joko as national chairman, and that he had now sat the Judo Keke, um, Edozian Joko, and taken over from him as acting national chairman. Now, for INEC, you go to the, uh, the law requires that all political parties must keep on the list of their national officers with INEC. There was never any minute that the name of a Dozian Joko or Judo Keke was with INEC as an officer of the party. So how could you then emerge from the blues and then claim you were once, you were the deputy and you have taken over and so on and so forth and INEC. But like I said, I'm confident that INEC in the fullness of time would, you know, um, rise up to the occasion. And by the way, uh, because also the INEC in its uh, press release, following the release of the names last week, did indicate that it will continue to obey court orders and judgments. Okay, fair enough. Uh, if he decided to ignore the previous three uh, court orders and judgments in respect of Oye and my candidacy, and then obey the one of Benin Kudu, now the Oka one has come, and all fingers crossed, and we watch. Because so, so okay. Mr. In their Soludo, um, if INEC refuses to obey this court order, saying it's already standing on the one from Benin Kudu, what will be your next move? Oh, well, of course, um, I, I, I believe, well, if they refuse to do so, um, we'll see how that goes. That's on the one hand, I, I want to believe that they are, men and women of honor and integrity there um, uh, who live by their own words and by the words of the law, uh, by the laws of Nigeria. But besides, I mean, that wouldn't actually matter much whether they decide to obey or not to obey. Ultimately, they will have to obey uh, the, the, the laws of the land. Uh, I believe, I mean, we have also, of course, appealed that judgment of the uh, Benin Kudu, uh, so in Jigawa. Uh, and I think, I, um, uh, like I said, the judiciary of Nigeria always comes through in the end. Uh, the appeal court will take that up. Um, probably if, if it has to get to the Supreme Court, I believe um, that that would also um, uh, finally will get, will get justice. And, um, and uh, I'm confident that will be on the ballot uh, on November 6th. An election that I think uh, from the facts on the ground, we are primed to win overwhelmingly, uh, massively, uh, in terms of that. And I, I believe that that is why this whole conspiracy and theories to stop Saludo from being on the ballot uh, by those who think that a Saludo on the ballot actually oh, uh, forecloses the elect options for them. Um, well, you know, there's uh, still a couple of months uh, till November, and so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but I, I want to ask about uh, APGA itself. Um, with the little issues here that we've mentioned, you know, the judo KK emergence, uh, the uh, uh, Umoji's emergence also, it seems like there's some cracks in the, you know, in the party. And then people would also say uh, that there's, uh, uh, Abga may not even have such a strong hold anymore in Anambra, seeing the way that politics has played and been moving in Nigeria lately. Um, what would be your response uh, to that? I, as I said a moment ago, when you talk about uh, uh, the uh, our faction, 
quite frankly, it's a phantom faction. It's uh, it's just um, like a, it's just a creation of the last two weeks, so to speak. <laughs> Up until Friday last week, INEC knows it. All the Africa members throughout the country know it. They know we have one national chairman who has not been removed by anything. There's no crisis in Africa. These were the words of Africa, of uh, INEC. There is no crisis in Africa. So, the, and as we speak, thousands of people are joining Africa by the day in the run up to the election this year. By the way, as you speak, there are about 31 self funding. Uh, pressure groups, support groups that emerged in demand for Saluda to run for office. Hundreds of thousands of members, uh, you know, took it into these uh, support groups, and they are all ratcheted up and wired up to go for the election. And so, in Africa, there is no crime. There are external forces, some external forces, which could be expected. I mean, the opposition. Uh, I think that with a Saluda on the ballot and with Apuga dominantly controlling no less than about 70-80% of the political landscape in Anambra, in the last governorship election, we won 21 of the 21 local governments. Uh, the last election held in Anambra happened to be the House of Assembly election. Apuga won 80% of the seats. And even could have been a lot more about 90 or that about, but you know, let's leave the other ones uh, for some. Anambra is predominantly when it comes to local elections, assembly and governorship, Anambra people have almost this peculiar uh, uh, electoral behavior. When it comes to national elections, they are indifferent. When it comes to our local elections, they consider Apuga as their own. That's their own identity. Apuga is our people. And our people are trying to vote for Apuga again and again and again, 100%. Now the script is, if you can cause this kind of dissensions, and particularly target, uh, say, if you can keep Soludo, harass him out, uh, out of the race, so you may have also heard that somebody, uh, some uh, private person, went to court to say he's uh, having a criminal proceedings against Saludo. He didn't declare um, an, uh, an, uh, a property uh, that he rented for his family uh, many years ago, 2006, up until now. Oh, he should have declared it. And uh, I don't know when you start declaring rented property uh, as your own asset, uh, as it were. All this, and then trying to get uh, the courts or the police to go to harass him and all of that, they are just part of a script from external, as that's our own thinking, now from all that we can say. We don't believe, I don't think any African member seriously believes that what is going on is of Africa or that anybody else is seriously claiming to be a candidate of Africa. That's well, 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 Mr. Um, you are, of course, a former CBN governor. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people in Anambra, you know, they might look at it as, you know, a breath of fresh air, you know, a young, uh, vibrant uh, candidate, you know, to take over the seat of governor. Uh, that might be the thinking. But, you know, you earlier mentioned that uh, um, Anambra, you know, sees Abga as their own. Um, so is this because of the performance of the Abga candidates that have held, you know, the positions in that state for a long time? Would you, would you say that they've done very well with regards moving Anambra State forward? And I'm talking with regards infrastructural development, healthcare, education, security, and all the concerns that the electorate have. Would that be the reason they would continuously choose Abga? Or, or if there's a candidate that seems to have um, a better, you know, outlook with regards where he wants to take an umbra. Does that shake Abga's stance? Um, two things. Uh, yes, to your first part, uh, which is that Abga has served an umbra well. Abga has served an umbra well. From the time Peter B came, uh, he took over from Gige. Um, and you know what happened then, Gige struggled. Um, we did quite well, my, my own assessment, 
despite the harassment. Uh, but it was PDP then that burned her, burned down, and I'm facing him, actually kidnapped the sitting governor, uh, then PDP, and then he struggled, and then Peter became on the other platform, implementing the Agda Manifesto, that is a comprehensive development of the state. Peter B, a number of people had judged him to have done well. Now came Governor Obiano, taking it to the next level in terms of what infrastructure in all sectors of the, uh, the society, despite dwindling resources, when most states cannot pay salaries. We've just, you know, launched up the international airport in Anambra, an international conference center out there, and so on and so forth. Make a legacy project that Anambra people are saying, no, we want the good thing to continue. So, and Anam Apuga is the only political party that the decision about who becomes their governorship candidate is taken by the people of Anambra, uh, in Anambra, for Anambra. And our politics becomes local and our people are happy. They don't want it to go. And that's why you see, whenever you go all and all, you come back, the people say, we want Africa again. Now, on the other thing about maybe some other person, except the person is going to come from the uh, moon tomorrow, but if it is from people who are already on the terrain, um, well, I, uh, with every sense of uh, modesty and humility, maybe on the, uh, when we all roll out our credentials, our past, our records of public service, um, and uh, our vision for the state in terms of its consolidation and continuity of the agenda, then we'll see. Whether there is anyone else, it is left for the Anambra now people to decide whether there is anybody uh, who comes close to what we put out uh, for them. The people will decide. But if what we have on ground is anything to go by, the election, if held today, will be overwhelmingly after. Absolutely. Our target, actually, is to win the 326 wards out of the 326 wards. Uh, the target is not the 21 over 21. It's 326 words out of the 326 words. And I can then understand why the forces are aligned. Uh, you know, you want to sponsor a mall within Africa to see if you can succeed in destabilizing it. Um, but unfortunately, that isn't working. I mean, the, a number of people have seen through this plot. Uh, they're able to decode it and know that this is, this is not coming from anywhere. Uh, it's, it's, isn't it funny that someone that the party screened and found to be unfit for the office is now the one who goes a thousand kilometers and the party estate uh, court in Jigawa orders that his name should be put on there as a candidate of the same party. M Mr. Saludo. Mr. Saludo, yes, you, you just talked about Abga's credentials in the past few years and that the people of Anambra State will stand solidly behind Abga. But let's talk about you as a candidate. Do you think the people will stand solidly behind you and what your chances might be in that elections? Yeah, that's precisely what I said a moment ago. Actually, the movement for me to join was actually the people's demand. It's a people's movement. Uh, for over two years now, there have been massive movement in the state. Something new in our number of politics. Where the people, the ordinary men and women in the markets, uh, contributing money, devoting their own resources, their own talents, their time, and everything, organizing, mobilizing. We have 31 such groups, and about 15 of them actually have infrastructure in all the 326 wards in Anambra. M Mr. Saludo, yeah. why, do you, why do you think you have that support? What do you think you're bringing to the table for the Anambra people that you say make them support you so much? I think um, I will be one candidate that will be running on record of public service. The people of Anambra know who Saludo is. The people of Anambra recall my time at the, in public service as Chief Economic Advisor to the President, and as the Chairman of the Drafting Committee that drafted the Nigerian Needs National Economic Empowerment and Development Strategy that was implemented under Obasanjo's regime, and that saw Nigeria 
that implementation of that saw Nigeria at um, have its unprecedented economic boom in history. And they saw that they had governor of Central Bank, and they saw the transformation uh, that came with the, uh, the banking system. The banking system today, the history is before and after Saluda, and they know the difference. They see themselves, they see how millions of people, or thousands of uh, investors, can now have access to finance and so on. They saw the things that we were able to create. I, I can go on and on. We'll have time. We don't have time to go through that. So the people of Anambra, this is this is not the time at the time of uh, turmoil in the global economy, post-COVID world, transition to a post-oil economy, when many states are having difficulty paying salaries. This is not the time for learning on the job. You need someone who is tried and tested. And that's why they're clamoring. They're asking me to come and run. They're asking me to come and um, sir, You have served the world, consultant to mm, formerly consultant to 20 international financial and development institutions, and all the awards there is to win. I've served the nation, the grateful nation, in appreciation of my exemplary public service, honored me with the third highest national honor. And uh, with all the awards globally and nationally, over 200 of them. And now my people say, whatever you have done in the world, you've done in Nigeria, come home and do the same for our people. And it is that call that I am answering. I am going home in gratitude to God for his bountiful blessing to offer my service to the people. The people know Saluda and they know what I have done. And this election will be run on record of exemplary public service, and we're going to be uh, discussing that in the fullness of time. It will be talking in terms of the, of the audacity of our vision, of our I mean, ambition for the state, to put our state, consolidate on what has gone, and to continue to put our state on the map. For an itinerant people like Anambra, with over 20 million of our people, that's what is at stake scattered all over the world, that we will, our mission, or the Afghan mission, is to continue to consolidate, to build that prosperous homeland, that any of us, or anywhere, that doesn't feel comfortable where he is, can have a livable, prosperous homeland to return to. All right. That's Mr. What Soludo. I, why uh, the people of Anambra think they will need a solution to continue for where Obi is. And I'm offering myself, like I said, in gratitude to God for his blessings and to serve my people as right. they have demanded. All right, Mr. Soludo, um, um, you've, of course, spoken extensively with regards to your record and uh, what you plan to do. Um, one of the reasons, you know, we have these conversations is for people of the Southeast and for Anambra state people to be able to hear and, um, um, you know, see, you know, further than just politicking. Um, it's important, and I, I believe it's important for every Anambra, um, Anambrarian, as they're, you know, called, to understand what the next four years of their lives will be like under the leadership of whoever it is that takes over that seat. And that's why I, I always refer back to where, you know, you're coming from, where, you know, Willie Obiano is coming from. Uh, the Minister of Labour, um, you know, criticised him and said that he had done poorly and he had filled an Ambra state, stated that there is, you know, you know, very, very poor development with regards to primary health care in the state and not very much has been done. And that is, you know, um, Chris Ngige speaking now, not, not us. Um, so I, I, I want you to, you know, quickly share with us, you know, how, how well Anambra has done with regards health care in the last four years or in the last eight years. Um, is there any hospital that you currently, you know, can willingly drive yourself to and say, okay, this is where I will, you know, take, you know, med do my medical checkups um, currently. And then also you can flow from there. You can also speak about the IPOB um, issues and uh, the ESN and how, you know, that sh might be dealt with. Voter apathy is something that uh, the Southeast has dealt with for a long time also. But let's start with healthcare. Um, it is a bit interesting uh, when you're having the season of politics. Um, Dr. Ngege is a uh, um, um, uh, friend, uh, former governor, that uh, himself, um, I give him credit for focusing on um, some few strategic roles which he did well uh, on. 
and um, probably he had his plans, as I understand, to go into other sectors, uh, but couldn't. Uh, now, in Anambra, let's get down. Let me start with, uh, you talk about healthcare, but let me first of all give you the summary in depth of the welfare of the people, which encapsulates all that you talk about, and which is the incidence of poverty, uh, my, for my, my friends. The summary of the welfare of the people is measured largely, I mean, there are series of indicators, how long they live and so on and so forth, and how poor they are, of course, how poor they are, is also implication for how long they live. Uh, as the case may be. Let me point out the statistics. Summary. It's not mine. It's not in Gigas. It's not anybody's. By 2010, the National Bureau of Statistics indicated that Anambra's level of poverty was 53% uh, of incidence of poverty. It means 53% of the residents were poor. Last year, the same National Bureau of Statistics published the statistics to say that in Anambra, Poverty has dropped between then and last year precipitously to 14.78. That's a summary indicator of the welfare of the people under Governor Obiano since 2014 to date. Now, with that summary statistics, and it says you can write a book about that. Now, let's down, come down to the sector. Well, you've got to also go back to where are we coming from? What did you have before relative to where we are today? <laughs> if we get said, oh, you don't have primary, well, there wasn't even any. Today, you have the teaching hospitals, you even have Anambra's um, oxygen plant, for example, that is supplying the rest of the country. Look at the incidence of the COVID uh, pandemic that was ravaging everywhere, and Anambra as the all commerce place like Lagos. Look at our numbers. And how we've managed is our healthcare delivery that actually tackled much of this. The infrastructure that is in place at the teaching hospital, even the state teaching hospital, uh, the, the state, uh, the state uh, university uh, uh, teaching hospital at Amaco, where a lot of the patients on COVID and so on have been treated. I, I guess you get to give the state and the governor. Uh, quite a bit of uh, credit. All right. Now, Quick, quickly uh, talk IPOB before we go. Um, um, how you know you think that might affect uh, the elections November six, and what you think must be done? You know, from the governorship level, uh, the traditional level, uh, or Anes Ndigbo also. Um, you know, to handle uh, the uh, call for secession. I think that will be. Um, I will have um, uh, uh, different form to address, I mean, because uh, this is not, uh, if you've got only uh, three minutes, four minutes, uh, 30 minutes to talk about IPOB, then that's not, uh, it's better I would not uh, uh, discuss that. But it is a subject that needs to be discussed. I had, um, uh, in a book review that I had, I think in 2017 or thereabout, or 2016, and Ofodile, uh, Chude, Honorable Chude Ofodile had a, a published a book, a very important book on Bafra and Nigeria and, and all of that. And uh, during that book review, I did call for a very structured conversation, particularly among the Igbo elite, about the Biafra Pact and the IPOB and so on. And uh, when uh, Nam Bekano was, uh, when, he was uh, when he was arrested, um, and detained, I think, in 2017 or so. Um, I never knew him, never saw him. I've never still not met him. I never met him. Um, there was all this clarion call among the Igbo leaders and all. For me, um, when it concerns any Nigerian and there is an issue of, um, you know, rule of law and deprivation of fundamental rights, uh, I am concerned as a Nigerian. And um, I led a team of Igbo leaders, about 12 of us, including part, uh, Professor Pat Otak and um, others. And we visited him at the, uh, the prison. That was the first and the last time I met him. And um, after visiting, we addressed an international press conference. 
and called for his release. And consequent of what we also called for a structured conversation around this particular issue. And there are alternative visions about uh, that some of us uh, who kept uh, talking about um, the restructured Nigeria, uh, viable Nigeria, we believe the future of uh, we are better and stronger um, together. Right. Uh, um, and I am a Pan Africanist who believes in um, you know, Professor Soludo. dreaming of the states of Africa as it were. But that we need to have conversation around several of the issues being uh, raised, thrown up by these guys, the method and what they are clamoring right. on. Professor Soludo, uh, uh, I. It's, it's, that's why I said. Just one more minute. Okay, brilliant. Go ahead, because we need to wrap up. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, several people might have issues with the means or even the end of this. That's a legitimate one, and there needs to be that debate. Okay? There are others in the world. When I was the chairman of the Planning and Strategy Committee, we launched the Igbo position on the restructuring of Nigeria at the Women's Square. I read out the position of Nibo on that occasion. All Igbo leaders were there on our own sense of how a Nigeria, a stronger Nigeria, will look like, which is what we all dream about. But that in the context of that, that there needs to be a structured conversation. In the run up to the election, I think that conversation will not go away. Um, All right. Not to come. We don't wish it away. We have to add some, I mean, uh, increasingly almost on a daily basis now, the elite in the Southeast, the Hanes, the everybody, that's a conversation we must all get involved with. All right. Because Professor Solodo. we can't prosperous homeland without a peaceful homeland. Absolutely. And I think that is um, a subject that I, as a person, and together with all the other leaders around the uh, Southeast, and the uh, leaders in Nigeria that we need to have these robust conversations to continue to make our country, our nation, a more perfect society. All right, I think that's a, that's a good place to to, uh, to land. Uh, Professor Chukuma Soludo, thank you very much for your time this thank morning. Thank you. Um, congratulations on the court order, and uh, we'd love to speak with you again uh, just before the elections proper. Court judgment. I beg your pardon. <laughs> we'll love to speak with you again before the elections proper. All right. And uh, happy Salah once again. Thank you. All right. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving into a different conversation entirely, and that is for, from Bishop Kuka and his uh, response to the Nigerian government. We'll talk about it after the short break. Stay with us.